Okay, it looks like we have a few of you here. I think we'll go ahead and uh, get started. If I get started real quick, you know, we have a drawing at the end for some, uh, some hardware here and, and paying for some fun. So if we can get through this real quick before anybody else gets in here, you got a better chance, right? Okay, here we go. Okay, my name is Bob Twiggs. Uh, right now, I'm a professor at Moorhead State University in Kentucky, and what the heck am I doing here in Silicon Valley, you know? Well, it turns out I've spent a lot of time here in Silicon Valley. Uh, I was just recently uh, retired as an emeritus professor from Stanford University in the aeronautics and astronautics department. And uh, when I retired, uh, you know, I went fishing, but the fishing wasn't quite so good. And then some people showed me in, uh, and as I'll show you in Kentucky, they had this nice big antenna, which us space guys love. And they had a nice new building to work in. So, you know, I was very envious. And I said, you know, can I come and play with you, you know? And they were fortunate enough to, or I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to do that. So I'm, I'm still playing, you know, I guess us old space guys, as they say, we, you know, we don't, we don't die. We just keep going, you know, up and up. So, all right. So here we go. I want to tell you a little bit today about some of the things that we're doing and a little bit about, you know, why space education? Why did we put space in education? Uh, I want to tell you uh, what's available in this particular area. Uh, I want to show you what kind of things we're doing at Moorhead State and why. And then about opportunities that are available today and in the near future. And then we'll do this drawing for the prize. Okay, why space education? Can anybody here tell me why you think using space in education may be a good thing? Anybody? It isn't a good thing? Okay, well, I happen to think it is because I, from, from starting in the, the space time back in the 60s, I've always been interested in space. And you'd be surprised how that turns students on is to work at something that they're going to get to put in space. Okay, I say not dinosaurs. I'm Okay, motivational. I think it's very motivational. The students are, and you know, kids are starting to get interested in what's in space now because it's, it's really expanding. It's kind of after the, the moon thing, you know, and, uh, you know, it kind of went away and it wasn't a very good thing. And I think we're starting to see things now that are exciting, and especially it's important that the costs are coming down in order to get into space. It used to be a very exclusive club of the government. And now it's getting down to the point where an individual can actually put his own satellite into space, okay? Has job potential. We think that that's a, that's a good thing. Now, even in my mind, students that work on things in space, the things that they learn there is applicable to lots of other jobs because they have to work in teams, interdisciplinary teams. We have to, they have to manage. We have them do systems engineering sorts of things. And then they have to build hardware that works. There is no fixing it in space. You know, it's not you run it in the hall. And if it doesn't work, you, you fix it. This is real stuff. And it's challenging, very challenging to think about what things have to go through in space. It's not quite like setting something on the floor here in this room. There are environmental conditions that you have to meet. And the other thing that's probably my big reason is that it lets me play with toys. Now, I've got, I've got a phone call. This is a terrible time for a phone call. No, please, no, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, that loses you. Okay, anyway, we like to play with toys. And uh, we've, uh, we've got a gentleman here that's an engineer at Zilog, and he loves to play with toys because I've seen his, uh, we go out to the desert and fly rockets, and you ought to see his motor home. It's just plumb full of goodies. And you can't tell me that those aren't toys, but we'll pretend that they're scientific endeavors, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, so what's a... We have been working with for a few years, and it's a thing that looks about like this. This isn't a cricket set. This is a thing called a buzzbot. 
But the Cricutsat is the thing that has a 555 timer on it with a, with a thermistor in the circuit so that the oscillation frequency of the A-stable 555 timer changes with temperature. And all we do is we hook those onto balloons. We got a little milliwatt level transmitter and they just put them on a balloon and they just let them go and you listen to them with the radio and you can see what the temperature somebody they need to know who flew it. Now what I do is I put on the back of that card, you know, please return $10 reward. And we've been over to the park here at Rancho San Antonio and flown those, and we've had them actually go all the way across the bay over here. They'll go up and as they expand the, the balloon will break and they come down. And one day I got this call from a gentleman, he says, this thing lit on the top of my house. He says, I don't know what it is, but you know, I took life and limb to get up there and get it off. You better come and pick it up. I said, where do you live? And it turned out he only lived a few blocks from where I live, you know, and I thought, boy, that's a way to ruin a neighbor, you know. So, but I went over and seen the guy and I thought, oh, this is going to be rough, you know. But I went over and seen him and what I told him, what it was, it was stuff that the students was like. He got really interested in it and he didn't even take my $10, you know, that's the kind of guy I like. Okay, CANSATs, what the heck? Um, we were kidding around one time in a meeting in Hawaii about flying things in space, and all of us had a Coke can sitting around, we'd all been drinking, and somebody says, what's the size of things you put in space? And I jokingly held up this Coke can, and I says, you can put things in space this size. And we had a bunch of Japanese students there, and I said, how would you like to build a satellite that goes in this? And they jumped up, they were so excited, and all of our U.S. students, for some reason, didn't do anything. They didn't know what I was talking about. But the Japanese students got a hold of it. And so now, if you look on the web and you look at CANSATs, you'll find all over the world people are flying CANSATs. And the idea is, if I tell you a, a CANSAT, and you know the CAN is referring to a a soda can, you know exactly what size it is. If I say, I'm going to fly a satellite, you don't have the foggiest idea. That doesn't define it at all. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass these around and let you look at them. And this is the, this is the kit that we have that we're going to raffle off today. These things come from a company called Pratt Hobbies and you put them together and then you get to go fly them and we'll show you how, how they fly. The other thing that I have here is this little thing here, and uh, it's a, just a little device that allows you to put a few components together that turns out to be absolutely useless, but it's really a lot of fun. If you listen to this, I wanted something that had a light, made noise, and had motion. So, see, isn't that really clever? Well, I'll pass that out too and, and let you look around. But you know what? The people that get the most fun out of that are the adults putting it together. I had two executives from Lockheed Martin come over to Stanford and I said, I want you two to build one of these little buzz bots. And the guy says, okay, he was really nervous. I says, you guys are engineers, right? He says, yeah, but a long time ago. He says, now we're executives. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what I do. If you build and it doesn't work, I won't tell your boss. And he said, deal. But they both got them to work. So anyway, it was a lot of fun for them. The other thing we do is play with bigger rockets, and I'll show you some of those. Uh, we actually are involved in some suborbital launches, and then we do have orbital launches that we're working with. So we got the whole range of things. This is what goes on with a cricket sat. But this is a, a really a fun thing to do. You can do a mission with all of its aspects of it, planning for the mission uh, and everything else. So, you know, I'd really encourage you. How many of you in here have children? Okay. How many of you spend lots of time with your children doing electronic stuff? One, two, not enough, right? 
Here's something you can do with them that's really easy. You can go over to Rancho San Antonio and fly this thing, something really easy. If you want to find out more about it, you know, get on the web and look up CricketSat, but it's for the kids. Now, I want to tell you um, a little thing about what we do every once in a while. Um, should we really tell them? Okay. Anyway, we like to go out in the desert. How many of you like to go out in the desert? Okay. How many have ever been to the Nevada desert? Uh, how many of you have ever been to Burning Man? Ah, okay. That is the real desert, right? And Gerlach that you go through that if you sneeze you miss is the real west, right? Did you ever stop and eat there? Oh, you should sometime, you know. Uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, that's quite a place out there where the, where the Burning Man's at. And we'll tell you a little bit about it. Here's a picture that I can show you and you... And that gives you the round thing here, this thing right here, is where they hold, well, I can't find my cursor, that's... This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like at the tents. Here. And I'll show you what happens here after this thing uh, launches. Okay, this is what the rocket looks like. When it gets up to Apogee, uh, there's a little computer in it that fires some charges and actually blows the thing apart in three pieces. It blows off the aft end. It has a parachute in that comes down with part with a motor blows off the nose cone, it has a parachute. Blows off the center section, it also has a parachute. But what happens is there's a delayed charge in the nose, or in this center section, and what that does is actually blows this carrier out. When the carrier gets to the end of the tether, whatever's in that carrier gets flung out. So that's the way we launch things. Not too gentle, but it works pretty well. Thing go. Some of the things that they fly besides these CANSATs are rovers. Now think about that. How many of you in here are willing to take on a challenge to do that today? You would like to do that? You're on. I want your card. Because it took those students, graduate students from Japan, four years, four years to do that. There are a few slight problems. One is you've got to put it in that carrier along with a parachute. It's got to come down. It's got to get away from the parachute. 
and then it's got to get all the way back, which sometimes is, is four or five miles, and you have to do all that on a battery. And I'll show you some of their tries to do it. It's really interesting. Would you go get that lady's card before she gets away? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's really quite a, quite a challenge to do that. And I'll show you some videos on it. So here's the first one. And this is uh, some of the data they collected from launch to altitude and showing it coming down. And this is the full distance. They went uh, uh, 7.25 kilometers. What, they, um, what we do out there is we have about three days that we launch. And then we go into Bruno's, the, the local bar there. And in the back, they have a place where we have breakfast. And the students present on what they've done. And when the student showed this particular video, somebody in the, in the, after he got through, somebody in the back of the audience stood up and said, <clears throat> how did it hit the flag? Because, you know, its GPS is not that good. And the student thought for a minute and he says, well, what we did is we programmed it such that when it got near the flag, it was supposed to spiral in and hit the flag. Well, you see there, it didn't spiral in. It just went whew, banged right into the flag. And the guy says, but it didn't do that. He says, how did it do that? And the student thought for a minute. He says, I don't know. So, <laughs> but you know, that, that's pretty cool to, to see that sort of thing. Let me show you some other things here. And you see, you see your challenge there now? Pretty good, huh? Okay. You still want to take that challenge? You see she's waffling a little bit? No, she's not waffling. Okay. Let's look at some other things. What, what else happens, you know, in this business of getting into space? <clears throat> Let me show you a bigger rocket. This is down in the Mojave Desert. Okay, we've got some payloads that we're going to put it. And then it lands. Uh, was that a success or not a success? Here's some there. There's the nose cone. educationally it's a super success if it went perfectly they wouldn't have anything to analyze right they had something to analyze here I think they went back and did some work on the on the fins right but it was tremendous that's really fun to to go out there and uh, see that sort of thing that can work clear up into K-band. So that's a pretty good dish, worth about, I think, four and a half million dollars. And then this is the building that they built. And that's what it looks like inside. Beautiful, beautiful place. They were, this little school, Moorhead, 
has about 15,000 students. It's in a town of about 25,000. And the guy that run this program was able to raise the money to build that dish and another 15 million to build the building and equip it. So it's really quite, a, quite an opportunity there. <clears throat> have a system set up where we have uh, geostationary communication and uh, we'll be able to let kids in the classroom do things. You see on the far right, right hand corner, These guys will fly anything. I'll tell you, I seen one guy out there had a thing that looked like a big tomato can. Did you see that? You remember that? Yeah, they fly outhouses, they fly everything, you know. What a bunch. I I'm sure glad to be out there associated with them. <laughs> I don't know whether this was loaded with hamburgers or not, but uh, I didn't check it. Thought that's pretty cool. You know what? It didn't fly very good either. This is another program that we've worked And the guy that you see down on the left, is, he likes to play with toys just like we do. This is another one that we just finished up. But the idea, if you can get on anything, can you make it survive? So these. Now, a normal launch that we have for CubeSats, how many are familiar with CubeSats? Anybody? A CubeSat is a satellite that's a four-inch cube, and we developed that several years ago at Stanford for educational purposes. But InterOrbital will not only sell you a launch, but they'll give you the kit with it so you can get up into space. We have some test flights with them. Uh, We're working with the University of Rome on a satellite called EduSat. We've got a thing called Pocket Cube. When we come up with a CubeSat, the prices went from $40,000 to $80,000 per launch. Thank you to the, our federal government. They decided that the CubeSat was a pretty good deal, so they jumped in there and the price doubled on it. So we figured, well, we'd do them a better one. So we come in and cut the cube in half, and if you cut it in half, you end up with, with uh, this thing here. It's called a pocket cube for obvious reasons, right? It fits in your pocket. And I've been told, and I wouldn't tell my wife this, but this works really great if you go into the bar and you go up next to this really good looking girl and you say, would you like to come to my place and see my satellite, you know? So you're not carrying something big in, but you got something to tempt her with, right? Now, who wouldn't want to go see a satellite in your apartment, you know? Okay, anyway, this is a, this is a, uh, a CubeSat. We're actually gonna fly some of these, put them in space. So this is a personal satellite and the cost for launching one of these is about $8,000. There's a local company called AstroDev that builds all the parts for them for about uh, $1,500. So for less than $10,000, you can have your own personal satellite. And so if anybody's interested in that, uh, let me know. Uh, I guess we can pass that around. <coughs>
Okay, so that's one thing we're doing is launching pocket cubes. We've got a, a um, program that I'll show you a little bit later about being able to put payloads on the, uh, the International Space Station. And we've got a student that's at um, Moorhead that's a graduate student from the University of Rome and she's flying uh, these kind of things in a, in a satellite. And what her interest is, is if we put things on the International Space Station, the thing that you get is you get microgravity. And things develop different in microgravity than they do under gravity situation. So what she's doing is putting this in there with cancer cells. She wants to see if in microgravity the cancer cells behave any different than they do in gravity. And if they do, you know, is it better, is it worse? We don't know. But we found in a lot of cases that, and, and NASA has found in a lot of experiments, things happen differently in space. So there's a, a whole opportunity for, for biomedical processing, for uh, materials processing, and so on by putting things on the, the uh, International Space Station, and I'll show you how we do that. We got another satellite that we're working with with the Air Force called Rampart. We're actually working with Valley Christian School down here in San Jose. They're going to fly one of these things on the uh, International Space Station and will be the first high school that's ever done so. We're working with a school, um, Flemingsburg County High School in Kentucky, to do the same thing. Uh, there's a program called QB50. This is what the inner orbital rocket looks like. This is the one that cost you $8,000. Then we're working with um, the University of Rome. They have this satellite called Of 2000 to early 2010 and then this is what we're going to do we're actually going to end so the pocket cubes up there and there's a possibility we can put some cube sats in the middle of it here's the thing that we call we call this thing uh, nano racks and what the concept cube labs and that's where you put experiments you take all that you and these are the kinds of cells that they're This so again is the, is the Rax Valley Christian is going to fly an experiment. This is the Rampart. This is the satellite. This is the QB50. This is some of the prices that we're looking at on them. So what we've got is not only have we got some things already with the University of Rome, they're collaborating with us and they've paid for three more launchers.
anyway, we're going to get on to the drawing here. We're getting pretty close to that. And what you're going to get with this drawing is the following. Someone's going to get uh, a CANSAT kit. This is the CANSAT kit. And what goes along with that is a certificate that pays for your launch out at Arliss in Nevada. Plus, they're going to pay for some uh, motel nights in, in Gerlach. So, and Gerlach is not like the Hilton Hotel, but it's a place to stay and you've got a shower in it. So, uh, huh? <laughs> okay. We've got some other things too today. Uh, we got from Zilog two development kits and maybe, maybe you can tell them, is there something different between these two? Can, can you hear me? Okay. Um, let me just make, a, just if I could, a couple comments. Um, uh, so uh, the, uh, the Black Rock Desert that Bob is describing where we launch rockets, it's very unique. Um, the only place in the world that you can fly, you and I can fly rockets up to 100,000 feet. So it's, it's an amazing place, and it's very tough to get a rocket that people build in their garages to fly that high. Are they um, putting, are they putting business it, cards in it, there? Um, What's, what's the challenge and where, where my passion is, I'm, I work for Zilog, uh, my name is Stephen Pope, I'm sorry, I should introduce myself, um, and my hobby is flying rockets, so I've been doing this since 2003, uh, hooked up with Bob, and I like to not only build the rockets, but then add electronics to them, and hence why I've you know, donated some kits from our company, um, and, and <coughs> some of the fun things, not only working with the students, but coming up with ideas that inspire people and I'll just throw one out that we had a couple years ago that was a lot of fun uh, th think of this we're launching a rocket um, 30,000 feet uh, in the air and electronics I mean this rocket is moving at, at uh, mock speeds okay so it's not moving slow it's moving very fast we're burning the propellant in about five seconds up to about 30,000 feet so a lot is happening as far as stresses on the electronics um, and what my challenge was that I kind of threw out there was I want the rocket to talk to me as it's flying. So on, on the ground by my uh, RV, I had a, a PA system hooked up, and then the electronics in the rocket was broadcasting wirelessly to this uh, receiver, and it was telling us real time altitude, speed, temperature, you know, what was happening <coughs> in the flight. And it, it's really challenging at those speeds to to pull all this off. So, you know, like, again, the challenge to, to you, if you're interested, you certainly want to make a trip to, uh, to BlackRock. The website, by the way, for the club that we're in is uh, aeropack.org. Um, and, and that, and you certainly you can come afterwards and, and talk if you want to talk more about it. Uh, but it's an incredible place if you want to go out there. And, and I, I'd have to say the, the video Bob showed when a rocket launches is nothing like seeing it in person. The forces and the sound effects are incredible. And most of them don't, don't survive. I mean, there's a, so it's hard to, to get these things to come back and refly them again. A lot of times the parachutes fail. There's a lot to go on. So the kits that we're going to donate, there's, there's two of them here. One of them is kind of the general purpose microcontroller um, that we use for some of these robots uh, that you saw on the video. And the other one is a motion detector kit. Full development kits. They have all the software. Very easy to get up and running and make things like this um, that Bob was showing um, fairly easily. Okay. Let's see. Uh, anyone that's interested uh, that may not have done, you need to put your card in here. I only put 10 of them in there. What we're going to do, the first one, we're going to give you a choice of the Zilog kit. The second one will be for the uh, CANSAT kit, and then the third one will be here. Now, I have a certificate here that says that you will be reimbursed up to $500 for one launch and four days in the motel out there. Now, maybe the cost of four days in the motel, I'm not sure. It's a very inexpensive motel, I have to tell you that. It does have walls, I think. It does have walls, and it has a shower. Now, I know you have a motorhome that you stay out there, but I happen to stay in there. <laughs> How many out here really want to win that? Let's see. What kind of a deal can I make with you? Oh, there's a plastic card. Who has a plastic card? All right. Let's see. Valentina? Ah, 
Very good. Okay. We're going to do it again. Let me get to the bottom. This is for the CANSAT kit. And the hotel and all that? Now, did you tell me it was a green card you had? <laughs> he thinks I might not be doing this right. All right. Brent? Where's Brent? Okay, Brent. You get to go to beautiful Black Rock. Now, do you got any kids? Okay, they'll love this. This will be something they'll remember for the rest of their life. Have you ever been out there before? Will you come and tell us about it next year? Bob, you might want to mention where it's at. Oh, north of right, yeah, to get to there. And again, uh, uh, on any of these kits, uh, I'll give you, coming afterwards, I'll give you my business card. And I'm supposed to be your mentor, okay? I'll be your mentor, and I will provide the radio for you to use with your, your kid out there. You'll need a radio. Okay. The last, kid. the last one. Okay. Now, again, we're going to have a, a, a presentation tomorrow at 11 o'clock. I think it's in theater, too. And uh, if you can stand to listen to this again, you can get in on the drawing. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, this guy's cheating. He gave me two of them. Does that... Hey, cut that in half, will you? <laughs> John? From uh, uh, Steerton? Is that right? Come on, John. Congratulations, John. You won something finally, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, come on up and see me. we got just a few minutes here. Hope you enjoyed a little bit about space. <laughs>